So a very warm welcome back, Digital Leaders. Um, we realise that we are battling one of the uh, most beautiful days of the year so far. Thank you so much for those of us who are, who are joining us. Uh, Robin will, of course, be giving away at three o'clock at the end of the conference um, a gift of a million pounds by lottery. So it's worthwhile, uh, definitely worthwhile hanging around for that. Um, but meanwhile, uh, no less excitingly, um, we've got uh, three very exciting speakers for the final leg of our conference. And as advertised before lunch, uh, we're now going to look at the different kind of um, perspectives, if you like, on digital leadership across SMEs and business, <clears throat> the health sector and across social enterprise. Um, and it's um, certainly... Um, uh, uh, with regard to SMEs and business, that we're very, very lucky to hear uh, now from Kirsty Waller, who is Vice President at UK, uh, sorry, UKI Marketing at Sage, um, business dealing with many, many, many SMEs in a digital capacity. So, very warm welcome, Kirsty. Nice to see you. Thank and you the the much. floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you to Robin um, and all of the team at Digital Leaders Week for inviting me to come in today. So why am I here and what am I going to be talking about? Well, at Sage, we support about a million UK SMEs and in fact, about 50% of the UK's PAYE workforce is paid through our software. So it gives us a unique perspective into how uh, SMEs are faring both today and what they're looking forward to for the future. So today I'm going to really have two lenses. The first one, is to take you through some of our most recent research on SMEs and their digital tech adoption, just to start, kind of set the scene in terms of where we are from a, a UK perspective in digital transformation from our perspective. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what I believe are the most important things for leaders to be thinking about as we continue this digital transformation and evolution of our UK business models. So when lockdown was announced, like you know, March 2020, I don't think any of us could have foreseen quite how long this was going to go on. And of course, for SMEs, it has been particularly difficult. And in many cases, a story of survival. And for many of those, that's continuing. You only had to look at the news yesterday and today to see that there's still very much an impact on our UK small and medium sized enterprises. But one of the other things that we've heard are some fantastic stories of resilience and transformation. And a lot of that transformation is being driven by technology that is allowing small and medium sized enterprises to change their business models and to drive uh, efficiency and productivity within their organizations. So through our research, we know that actually with hindsight, about 65% or two thirds of the UK's SMEs actually looking back over the last 15 months think that they've fared quite well. And those who have have been those that have really adopted technology, adopted technology to help them change the way that they engage with their colleagues um, and with their customers uh, to change their business models and to drive that productivity. And in fact, only a small minority of 9% tell us that their business has coped badly. Although about a quarter of all business owners say that they've had to uh, dip into their personal savings in order to stay afloat over the, the last 12 months. Um, but despite all of that, about 73% of businesses have increased uh, the amount that they've been investing in technology. Um, and one of the most important areas that they've been investing in is giving themselves uh, visibility into their business operations and how financially their business has been performing. So things like providing uh, instant access to cash forecasting, liquidity health checks, what if scenario planning, um, even if the what ifs that we're coming up against at the moment, we probably never would have dreamt of uh, two years ago. They're also using technology to take away manual data work to allow them as leaders to focus on the things that are most important to them and their businesses um, and also to allow uh, their colleagues to be the same. Um, and it really shines a light on how important technology adoption is in driving resilience within our UK SMEs. And they really are also the backbone of the UK British economy and are going to be key for us over the next few years as we come out of this 
with what we believe is the majority of net new jobs coming out of the SME sector. So technology is clearly front of mind for uh, private sector SMEs in terms of how they not only support their business today, but how they continue to transform their business in the future. Uh, but the question is, what do you need to do as a leader to prepare both yourself for change, your business for change, but also to take your staff with you? Um, so I think that the things I'm going to talk about next have come from not only our research um, with SMEs, but also some of the things that I personally have learned over the last 15 months and actually throughout my career in terms of sitting on a leadership team who had to lead 3,000 employees through you know, a, a period of immense change um, and transformation. And the big three takeaways for me are that we need to focus on what are our customers and colleagues really need? What are they really telling us? What do they really need? How can we be agile and how can we experiment more? And I think no matter how large or small your organization, the way that we work has changed probably forever over the last 12 months. Um, but that change doesn't stop. It's not a journey with a start and a finish. It's an evolution that we want to continue as we move forward. And as we've seen you know, through necessity, uh, as businesses evolve and they change their business models, they actually push us forward much quicker uh, than they would have done otherwise. So the first thing I would encourage leaders to do is really reflect over what changes have been made over the last 18 months and the reasons behind them. What's working well and where is there opportunity for us to expand and experiment even further? And I think that that feedback needs to come not only from the leaders ourselves, but also from our colleagues and our customers. And in fact, I think customer needs needs to be at the heart of all change projects and all transformational product, uh, projects. No matter if you're a B2B um, organization, so you're selling to other businesses or you're selling to consumers, you are selling to people. And people's um, buying habits, preferences and needs are continuously evolving. And they're evolving now at a quicker speed than they ever have done in the past. So getting real-time insight into customer requirements and what their priorities are moving forward is going to be really key to ensuring that as you drive digital adoption and transformation in your business, you do it in the right way. Um, one of the ways that we do this at Sage is we have something called Sage Champions. And this is an online community. Again, it's completely digital. Um, and it's where we bring customers together to help them solve problems together. But it also provides a feedback mechanism for us in terms of where are we performing well and where are there opportunities for us to continuously evolve our business models to be more valuable to our customers. And I think a lot of the transformation that we've seen has been very uh, customer set centric to date. That's going to continue in the future. So having that clear view of requirements is absolutely key to continuously driving uh, transformation. I think the other thing is to embrace change and to look to continuously adapt. So once we understand where the change is that we need to drive in our businesses, it's um, you know, from that feedback from customers and from colleagues, we need to have a clear vision of where we want want our future to go but we also need to be really open for adaptation and again you know if the pandemic's taught us anything adaptivity is definitely something that we all need to embrace in the future and i think that through necessity we've all uh, done that um, and you know then it's all around communication um, communication of where and how you want to drive your business and why you want to drive it in that way and if we think about how to get colleague and employee engagement with change, communication is absolutely key. Um, I always think to myself, it's only when I'm sick of telling someone something time and time and time again, in terms of communicating a wider vis vision, is that really sinking in and being internalized by the people that I'm talking to. 
So over communication, absolutely key at a time like this, especially if you're looking for your employees to start adopting new technology and using new uh, technology, you need to sell that to them. You need to really bring them along on that journey with you and help them understand the benefits that that's going to bring to them um, as well as to the larger organization. Now, in addition to all of that, I think the, the big change that we're seeing in the SME community at the moment is uh, ways of working and this idea of a new normal. I think gone are the days uh, where physically employees are going to be in the office every day, nine to five, Monday to Friday. We are all now um, plugged in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can talk to people around the world in a very easy and connected way. Um, and I think we've also all got very used to the commutes. You know, if my commute from the kitchen to this room every morning is far easier for me and fits in with my life a lot easier than the commute that I used to make previously. And I think a lot of employees feel that way. In fact, 75% of global office workers say that they want to work from home at least one day a week going forward. And so what we're seeing is this mass emergence of hybrid working where you have sort of hubs of community and connectivity that uh, employees go to in order to engage in a very face-to-face -face and organic way. But then also you need to enable a workforce that is now disparate and working from many different places. And in some times, you know, that is from home. I think the other challenge within that uh, that we all need to face as leaders is that there are very different sentiments to what the future of work should look like. Um, I know from within my own organisation, there are those people who are really keen to get back in the office and start working together. And then there are those people who perhaps have found working from home um, suits them much better and suits their lifestyle much better and would prefer to work like that. So I think flexibility is going to be absolutely key as we move forward. And again, just to give you an example of, of how we're approaching this as a, a global organization at SAGE, um, experimentation has uh, become the key to how we work this. So we are, rather than ha having um, very sort of set rules around how and when and where people work, we're really providing the flexibility for the employees and the managers to set the um, agreements and the frameworks that work best for them. Now, you know, that flexibility works in all directions. So there's flexibility from a working perspective, but also flexibility in an expectation that people are able to come to offices when and as needed. Um, but it means that people can really work out what's going to be best for them, for their employees, for their teams, for their ways of working. And different teams will have very different um, sort of approaches to this. Um, but then in addition to that, there's what are the technology needs for managing a disparate and hybrid workforce where you've got people uh, based all over the place. And I think you know, there's a few things that come to mind. How do you track, manage and engage employees remotely and in different locations? How do you manage the more practical things of leave and holiday management, performance management, shift scheduling, expenses? You know, all of these things now, which may have been able to do um, sort of face-to-face -face and more paper-based previously, are now all moving online into online software, HR and payroll software that allow uh, people to be able to instantly access employee tools from outside of, of the traditional fire walk. Um, another thing, and I think this is relevant to both managing change and managing well-being, is the, the, the benefits package that we provide to employees going forward. Um, over the last 12 months, it has been challenging for you know, a lot of people, a lot of us uh, have found it challenging. And uh, you know, having the right support for employees going forward is going to allow them to be a lot more comfortable within their roles, within what the future looks like. And of course, therefore, 
a lot more comfortable in terms of how they adapt and um, embrace change and transformation going forward as well. So another piece of technology that um, you know, can be adopted is an employee benefits type package, which would provide one-to-one -one, um, GP appointments online, uh, counseling sessions where needed, and even discounts on uh, groceries and travel and things like that. But it's another way of engaging employees in a way that um, is remote and online, but also means that they are uh, connected um, to your business and feel as though that they are being rewarded and recognized from the business as well. I think there's a few other things also as leaders that, that um, are challenging with a new distributed uh, workforce. One of those is how do you keep in contact with what's happening within the business? And I think daily stand-ups and huddles are a great way of doing that. They're coming together for 15 minutes in the morning, just understanding what people are working on, what barriers they might be facing, because that's not always um, and that's not always something um, that that you can identify when you're not talking to them or sitting next to them on a on a daily basis, and really just getting a view of what's happening with the um, business. I think another way of sort of technology solutions we should all be looking at are, are brainstorming and whiteboarding type solutions. So Yammer, Yammer boards or micro boards, um, which allow people to almost bring that kind of in-person experience of brainstorming together, getting ideas down on paper, bring that into the virtual world. So it doesn't matter where you are, you're engaged in that process. And, and I for one really love um, doing that. And then finally, recognition and again another thing that really changes in this new virtual working world is it's no you're no longer able to walk up to someone's desk and, and thank them for the work they've put in and 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 you know recognize them in front of a larger uh, group of colleagues so again things like all hands meetings peer-to-peer -peer recognition all really important for um, engaging that workforce in this new way of working, ensuring that they are very much bought into your organization. Um, and, and again, helping you with that change process as you move forwards. And I think overall, it's about positivity. You know, we um, have seen some immense struggle over the last 12 months in some of our SME communities, but overarchingly, SMEs are telling us that they're feeling more positive about the future. Um, and that technology and transformation is helping them see where they're going to be going as they move forwards. And I think taking that positivity into our businesses, being very, um, uh, very clear on the changes that we want to drive, but also being very optimistic in what that's going to be able to deliver for you as a business is really going to help engage those colleagues within that process and drive uh, that change forward. So although COVID, you know, the restrictions won't last forever, I think the impact will last forever and the acceleration that it's given us in terms of transformation in the SME space um, will last forever. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, out of all of this, this is a very positive thing um, that's really going to drive and, and take the UK into that leaderboard in terms of our adoption of technology in driving product productivity um, and efficiency in the UK. So that was all I wanted to cover today. Thank you very much. And uh, Mark, I'll pass back to you, I think. And uh, apparently I need to pay you this when I say, I think you're on mute. I've done it again. <laughs> Just unbelievable. I was being careful that time as well. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. I think you picked up a couple of um, quite interesting things we haven't heard that much about yet so so in particular the kind of you know the importance of of businesses or employers to kind of reach out remotely the communication some of those incentives mm -hmm. i thought were really nice the notion that decision leads we need to work a bit harder to recognize and and keep keep people engaged and that's really you know very very difficult i also like the way that you you kind of balanced uh um kind of hubs of community and connectivity, I think you called them, balance with people working at home uh, and a kind of hybrid working model. And um, and apart from anything else, of course, um, you know, I think that SMEs 
uh, you, you recognise their, their essential role in, in providing net new employment um, and, and yeah. economic. And Sage plays a massive role in, in digitally supporting that. So thank you and Sage for on behalf of all SMEs in the UK, or most SMEs. Um, so listen, thank you so much. We haven't got time for Q&A chat, unfortunately, um, but um, uh, really good to hear from you. And thank you very much for picking up on some of those other areas that we haven't actually heard from in the conference thus far. Thanks. No problems. Thank you. Uh, and uh, our next speaker, uh, we're going to move to health. So it's from, from an SME and business perspective to health, <coughs> um, is uh, uh, Neve McKenna. Uh, Neve is a CIO at NHS Resolution, uh, where she's leading a major program uh, to embrace and enhance technology capability. And of course, I believe, Neve, that you're going to talk a bit about the challenge of doing that <coughs> whilst keeping the lights on and maintaining business as usual, because we can't all disappear into a huddle until the white smoke comes out of the chimney, can we? <laughs> anyway, uh, good to see you. Warm welcome and uh, looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and it was really, actually, I really enjoyed also listening to, to Kirsty's there. And I felt quite uh, positive and optimistic about the way in which we're hearing about SMEs embracing technology. So uh, as as Mark said, I'm I'm CIO for NHS. We're probably the, the healthcare system that you don't know, and and with and I'm glad if you don't, uh, because we handle claims and litigations on behalf of the NHS. Um, nearly everything the NHS does is is, is great, and uh, and it's an incredibly safe system. But occasionally things do go wrong and we're there to help resolve concerns and address problems when they go wrong. Um, and and it's, I was asked to talk today about leading in a digital age, but, but I actually thought I needed to change tack slightly um, because my background is not being a CIO in the NHS. Uh, I spent uh, most of my career actually working for a large uh, multinational consultancy firm and I changed jobs and I did so summer last year. So <laughs> I, I interviewed remotely, uh, I onboarded remotely and I had to bring together a new team remotely. So in a way, uh, my only option was to lead in a digital fashion as well as in a digital age, uh, because they were the only options open to me at the time. Uh, it's only not even a year later, um, so it might be a little early to say whether I've been successful in navigating this leadership challenge, but what I thought I'd do today is just tell you about some of the things I've tried to do and maybe just reflect on how I think that's changed or, or being different in, in a sort of a more digital and remote context. Um, uh, the first thing I would say is kind of around the foundations, right? I think there are two things uh, when you take on a new role or take on a new job, join a new organization. Uh, the first thing you have to do is just get to know that organization. Um, you know, it's very tempting to come in all guns blazing. I've got a new job. I've got to make a difference. I've got to do something big. Uh, and clever here, but actually it's a, it's a time to pause and reflect and learn about that organization. And to an extent, remote onboarding really helps in that because you can't come in and, 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 and do things quickly because actually, you know, quite frankly, just meeting everyone takes a lot longer remotely via Zoom or Teams because you've got to set up lots of one-to-ones with people. Um, and, if I'm honest, it's quite exhausting as well, meeting lots of people for the first time, you know, one after the other. There's only so many of those you can do in a day. And so actually I found I really spent probably a good month just speaking to people, getting to know who they were and trying to sort of piece together my understanding of the organization. And actually that pause and that time was really helpful. Um, but obviously, uh, you can't spend your whole life learning and you've got to, you know, come up with a vision and a purpose. And NHS Resolution, um, really interesting organization, very small, you know, very few number FTEs, really. We're about 450, but manage absolutely eye-watering sums of money. Um, we handle 2.2 billion pounds every year. We're actually the second biggest thing on the government's balance sheet after nuclear decommissioning um, with all the forward liabilities that we've got. So it's a small organization with a kind of a very big and important job. Um, but this organization had not done any digital transformation or transformation uh, in, in the sort of, you know, for quite some time. And hence they brought me in and this CIO role was brand new for them. 
and so you know that clarity of purpose and and being able to articulate why was i here what was i doing what were we about to try and do was really really important um sometimes you can join an organization and that clarity is there for you because it, i don't know it's a you know a, a, an organization with a very clear mission we had a very clear mission in terms of our core purpose um but trying to articulate the vision for the new directorate was really important and I'm talking to an organization that's quite not technical. They're not a particularly, you know, there, there are a lot of lawyers, claims handlers, those kinds of individuals. They're not tech technologists. And so I needed to spend time to get that, that clarity of purpose, but get it really simple. And we came up with this idea, came up with this idea of being fit, fit for purpose. So frictionless, intelligent and time proof. Try and explain to people what we were trying to do. We came up with a kind of a, a you know, a, a sort of a vision around that, around being integrated and aligned with the rest of the NHS, giving easy to use technology tools um, and, you know, having intelligence at our core. And so, you know, we you know, I spent a lot of time just explaining that, explaining that to the board, you know, you know, communicating that to my team, to the organization and so on. It was really important. And then we had a set of guiding principles that sat alongside that so that people had kind of got a sense of the guardrails, the technology guardrails. So when they were kind of going out and making decisions or trying to decide what was a good approach, they'd had those, they had sort of those guardrails in mind. So those were the kind of foundational things. Um, you know, they're probably not terribly surprising to you because I think anyone who, who does a new, you know, goes into a new role will probably do something similar. But obviously, um, I had to also try and think about a num number of other dimensions about how to kind of lead um, through, you know, this transformation or this start of this transformation. And there are kind of a few three areas I think I'll just focus on for a little bit more. One's the team, my team, my new team, the organization, the broader organization, and then myself actually is the last one. I think for the team, one of the important things is, is getting the right team in place. Um, inevitably, uh, we were at an inflection point. You know, we're trying to embark on a transformation. What got us here isn't going to be what get, you know brings us forward. Um, and so you've got to build the right team and have the right, you know, people in place and the structure and framework to do the job that it's at hand. Um, but you, I think you've got to be quite wary doing that in a, in a, um, in a remote setting because you don't get to know people as well. It takes a bit longer and you want to be wary of making decisions based on kind of, you know, quite, you know, quite limited interactions with people. Often they're quite set pieces, meetings, teams, calls, etc. And so actually, you know, almost, you know, tempering the need to say, right, I need to come in. I want to reorganize everything. I need to have things like, like that. I, I actually sort of slowed that down, brought in a couple of key, key roles. And then for the rest, we've waited a while. In fact, we're only just going through that, that organization change now. Um, so I think that was something that I was conscious that it was very easy to jump to assumptions, jump to conclusions. Um, in fact, it reminded me, I worked in Japan for three years and, and I remember someone telling me when I just arrived, they said, be careful not to assume that the people who speak the best English are the best people. They just speak the best English. Um, and so, you know, don't don't bring assumptions. Just, you know, if someone comes across well on a Teams call, it doesn't mean that they're the best person. It just means they're very comfortable with that medium. So that was one thing. Um, I think then providing support for the journey that we're on, it's a huge transformation for my organization, my technology organization, um, arguably more so than actually the, the rest of the business um, in some ways. We are moving from you know legacy, on-premise, bespoke, built systems to cloud, digital, SaaS platforms. Um, that is a huge amount of change. We're, we're moving from single supplier to multi-supplier. I mean, there's just everything is changing. And so actually I need people to feel really supported on that journey. And even though we're organizing ourselves differently, there is no question that I want everybody in this team to be part of the new organization. I just want to give them the skills and tools and capabilities for doing so. So I spent a lot of time on that um, and making sure that they feel supported on that journey. Um, 
some of that is about training and some of that is about, as Kirsty was mentioning, the communications and being really clear with people, doing lots of recognition, lots of thank yous, doing town halls, etc. Um, I think the other dimension is to bring authenticity and personality to it, right? Again, this is, can be a very impersonal medium here, um, always on a small screen and, and you lose something. And so one of the things I did consciously try and do is think about how I can bring some of that personality. So, you know, I've been doing these, um, you know, weekly kind of week notes type things, you know, I call them Friday thoughts. I just send a little email. Sometimes it's only a few sentences. Sometimes it's a little bit longer. I talk about things that have either struck me or that during the week or things that have happened um, and then I put a little uh, two little things I call them brain food and soul food and usually I put in a podcast or some event that I've attended something interesting a book I might have read for the brain food and for the soul food it tends to be something quite personal you know something I've been doing that week I've been trying to I don't know do some yoga or go for a walk or enjoy the flowers I think this week I'll probably talk about the roses that I've got in my garden which are smelling beautiful so just put a little bit of personality in it um, because I think that's that's also really important you know I need the team to get to know me um, as well as I need to get to know them so that's on the team side. On the organization side, I think one thing that as a leader, particularly in this kind of digital age and uh, and coming into a new role is you, you need to do a quick win, right? I mean, the, the, there's no question about it. People are going, okay, this is a new role. Why are you here? What are you doing? Um, this vision is all very great, but what does it mean for me? And so, uh, you know, you know, trying to find ways, uh, you know, some quick wins, some things you can do. And and interestingly, they don't always come from opportunities to deliver a thing or, or you know, roll out a new system. For me, one of them was actually a major incident that happened. Um, and it happened not that long after I was joined. And I was able to, you know, roll my sleeves up, get involved, you know, you know, show the organization that, A, I was taking it very seriously. I was personally involved in that, communicating well with them but also the kind of style of leadership that I wanted, which is a no blame culture, right? You know, things happen, things go wrong. Let's be calm. Let's work out how to get the service back. And then let's work out what went wrong and how we can improve for next time. And so I think sometimes you can happen upon these, these things that will help you um, demonstrate uh, some of the value that you can bring to the organization. The other one is around being very flexible. Um, you might have some very preconceived ideas. I certainly did uh, around what I thought the organization needed. Um, but you have to adapt and be flexible. So that listening point, that getting to know people, actually one of my other quick wins came from a conversation with someone who just shared a pain point with me. And I thought, oh, hang on, I think, I think I could see a technology that would sort that, that would help that. And I was able to, you know, go and trial that, bring a proof of concept and get that done quickly. Um, but that honestly, only, I would never have known that. It was only through that conversation with uh, this researcher that she shared with me this problem and I was going, okay, great, I can think I can do that. So that's the kind of organization team. I think you know, with any, uh, you know, and, and never is it more true. I think we all are starting to, you know, recognize the importance of looking after yourself. And I think uh, when you're starting a new role, that's really, really important. Um, checking in with yourself, you know, getting feedback from leadership. I did a 360 degree survey um, a few months ago, it was about six months after I joined, just to kind of see how I was getting on. Um, but, you know, investing time to, uh, you know, to make sure that you're responsive and 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 learning from you know sometimes you make mistakes and and learning from those but also getting external support and and I did that in a number of ways I I I you know reached out to colleagues that I that I had worked with previously um you know i had uh i had friends who worked in communications one of them kept, helped me come up with a fit uh frictionless intelligent time proof uh strap line she she works in marketing um and you know i just you know bought her lunch and we nattered it over uh, over lunchtime so there's there's things you can do i think to to make sure that you don't feel like you're on your own because it's very easy in this remote setting to feel a little bit on your own 
Um, and sometimes those things bring lucky breaks. I mean, I, I got a really lucky break by, you know, again, chatting to somebody I knew in NHS X who then said, oh, I think I have some funding that I can support you with. And so then I was able to, you know, go back to my organization and say, hey, I think I can do this project with some help here from NHS X. And that went really well. So, um, that was some of the things they may be useful. I hope they are uh, for for others to consider if you're if you're kind of changing roles in in this circumstance. And I think uh, as we're all saying, you know, everything. It, well, the one thing is certain: we've changed the way we're going to work forever. So I think anyone changing roles from now on may well have to address some, you know, this remote onboarding thing. I think just a couple of minutes I thought I'd spend on just the the health angle. Uh, we're not frontline healthcare workers, but we are a government organization. We, you know, we operate in the health system. And so I thought it'd be just good to reflect a couple of minutes on what the angle is on that and, and some of the challenges that that can bring from a leadership perspective, particularly in digital age. Um, you know, the motivation and culture, I think, in public sector is slightly different. Um, there is this motivation, this kind of intrinsic wanting to help others. And NHS resolution is no exception. You know, it's really amazing to see that that core of wanting to help, wanting to do things better. And you get that, you know, very strongly in the health sector. And that's that's fantastic. But what you don't necessarily get are other tools to, for example, attract people into your organization. So things like salaries, the employee packages, you know, these things are very regimented and quite difficult to work around. And so you can't, you know, necessarily attract people for those reasons. So you really have to try and work on some of those other points. You know, do they have that kind of intrinsic motivation? but also some of the other things you do have. And in fact, Kirsty talked about some of them around the support, but also we offer a lot of training. We're quite a flexible employer. We're able to, you know, give people, you know, quite a lot of responsibility. Um, we're able to adapt to different circumstances. And so I think there are, you know, one of the things I'm still, you know, I can't say I've got this right, I'm still trying to do is make sure that we can highlight those elements that we can really give, you know, we can give absolutely fantastic groundbreaking experiences to people you know career making experiences to people um, but they just don't come necessarily with a with a private sector uh, pay package attached to them and so you know trying to find that way and being clear about those things uh, you know I have found the best way to do that is to literally talk to people so I now do a huge amount of you know outreach talking to people talking to contacts um, using networks you know there's some great networks in the NHS you know things like the Shuri network to you know get um, people from more diverse backgrounds involved in technology and you know using all of that and just keeping talking about what you do is a great way to attract people to your organization um, so I'm conscious of time and I, 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 I and, and the the sun outside as well uh, so I won't I won't uh, spend too much longer but I suppose just in summary I would say you know, for me, I found that many of the sort of traditional leadership techniques, um, you know, remain valid in, in a digital and post-pandemic era. Um, I think sometimes there's a tendency to think everything needs to be different in a time of change. But some of those fundamentals don't change. Those fundamentals are being authentic, um, you know, getting to know people, um, you know, having clarity of purpose. They're all, you know, those things were true before, they're true today. Um, I think, you know, the focus on inspiring people and taking people on the journey with you, um, you know, is still really, really important. It's just the way in which you do it might change and you have to put an awful lot more effort into trying and convey the message um, to people um, because those digital tools um, are very helpful because you can record things and, you know, have people play it at their, you know, in their own time. But you do sometimes lose a little bit of that connection with people and the chance, you know, sometimes for people to ask questions and really understand. But the way in which you do it, it might be different. But those fundamentals for me are still very much the same. I think that's me done. And so uh, back to you. And you are on mute again, Mark, I'm afraid to say. That is definitely another 50p in the jar. It's, it's just 
just weird. I only pressed it once this time as well. I normally I've been double pressing it and turning myself off. It's hideous. Um, listen, that was really, really insightful. There's a whole cluster of things. And what was really helpful, I think, particularly at this point in the conference, is we've had a lot of kind of big theme issues that we've talked and worked our way through. And you've offered us lots and lots of very kind of personalized um, and kind of strongly felt experience, really. And just, just those things about, for example, you know, you've got to reach out to people, you've got to talk to them to understand the pain points that you could address in the first place. So even if you're trying to design make a difference without that, with, without that reaching out. The authenticity thing has appeared a number of times today, but I think you've really, really brought it to life in terms of some of the actual things you've been doing to, to enable that and the kind of, you know, so those weekly um, uh, emails. There's, there's somebody in the organization I work for who, who releases a little video, you know, with a, with a sort of a, with a funny theme yeah. tune, you know, every week or, or whatever, but that's not for everybody. And also I think something that really resonated with me is, and, and your story about working in Japan, you know, that not everyone who speaks English best is the best. And, and uh, I'm very conscious and a lot of the, you know, we spend far too long, all of us, most of us, at least on Zoom and Teams and things, that, that some people can thrive in that environment. <clears throat> and mm. for other people, it's very difficult. And, and unless you really reach out and try and pull them in, actually, you're probably just, let alone for the ethical side you, dimension, you are depriving the organisation of what might be the, the best insights in the room. And um, yeah. Yeah. So I just think the, the multifarious ways in which we've all got to work quite a bit harder, I think, have been really yeah. brought alive by, by your talk. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Oh, my Cheers. pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, so now we're moving to the final um, uh, final talk of the day. Uh, well done, everybody, for um, still being with us, despite the beautiful sunshine outside. Only one more talk to go, and then Robin is going to divest himself of his million pounds, remember. So um, this time it's from Karen Lynch, who is uh, a VP um, at Social Enterprise UK. So we're going to move to insights from the uh, third sector. I think it's really fun if these, these kind of sector insights have been really, really revealing, I've found personally anyway, um, at this at this stage in the, in the, in the day. So looking forward to that. Um, I gather it is a recorded um, uh, talk. So I think, uh, Robin, if you're happy to and the team to roll the video, that'd be great. Robin? Or not, potentially. Just waiting for you to disappear, Mark. Uh -huh. Oh, right. Okay, sorry. What a great... And uh, I'm about to rush out and change what I, what I do immediately. Personal purpose, redefining the future of capitalism, social enterprises, digital social enterprises. Um, and I think that really captures the mood of the moment, actually, with lockdown and people questioning um the, their purpose but also social value of course which has now come of age really um particularly this year in 2021 so um well done um everybody who's who's still here i'm going to spend about three minutes summing up and then i'm um, get it all um all rush off in the sunshine um so so we had we, we've had a very very rich day actually and i'm just going to pick one or two pieces from from each of the from each of the talks we've had thread one was emerging areas of leadership to get right to build back better we heard from Secretary of State Matt Hancock about the need to turn to the next frontier and reimagine services, not just uh, look at the old, you know, replicate the old model. That was a real challenge to think and do things differently uh, that kind of starts at the top, if you like. Elizabeth Vega followed that up with a really nice kind of three tripartite view of leadership, leading, if you remember, from the front, side by side, and from the back. And leading from the back was something that really energised me, and we had a great chat about that. And Rachel Murphy then started talking about diversity and not not just diversity in the usual sense that we all acknowledge to be so important, but actually the diversity of, of ways in which w working digitally means that we have to engage with people. Uh, and there's a whole range of ways in which she had been doing that. She gave us some really nice examples about that. And also, I think she just talked about the unique pressure that we have as digital leaders in, in many ways, because we're delivering all the time. Um, uh, particularly particularly under lockdown and the pandemic. We then went to thread two, what's changed in the past 15 months and some of the relevant skill sets we need to be looking at. Um, and we started uh, with Pamela Dow. Um, and she's really talking about 
again, picking up on this idea of deeper networks to perform better in a complex system, I, I kind of really related to. So this complexification of digital leadership, it's not just about to sort of, uh, you know, to, to, to crack out your Sophia skill sets and, and think job done. This is a much more complex and subtle um, uh, subtle thing. And, and given her job, looking at building government skill sets across digital, um, it's good that she, she values that kind of more generalist um, as well as, uh, you know, technical um, uh, approach. You and Davis followed up, uh, looking from competences to communities, again, another theme there, um, and picking up, not for the first time, this, this notion of authenticity, people's increased desire to hear from the top tier, and the need, I think, to have purpose, which really came across um, clearly. Caroline Mulligan, um, final, finally in that sector, talked about ambiguity, and again, very, very congruent um, uh, sets of, of talks here, the need to earn trust and some of the complexities of doing this. And, and you remember this notion of disagreeing and commit. You may, you may uh, to, to encourage dissent, to encourage competition, uh, competition uh, but, but conversations, but even if uh, it goes your, it doesn't go your way, to then commit to what you co collectively decide to do, really important. Thread three was then, we're hearing from the three home nations. In the end, uh, we heard from two of them, but they were, they were fascinating. Uh, so uh, we had, um, we had Sally Meacham first, Wales, talking about the increased willingness to collaborate. She started to see as a result of the, the pandemic. Um, I really locked onto the Future Generations Act as something to go away and have a look at, which looks kind of interesting and resonates with my concern about what is our, as digital leaders, what's our legacy for future generations? What digital infrastructure will we have, will they have to share and benefit from to benefit public services as well as third sector and private sector? Um, and, and just that need again, she said, to develop a networked approach to delivery right across Wales, which, which echoed what Pamela had been talking about as well. Um, she'd been talking to Tom Reid earlier this morning, and then we went to Tom Reid himself, and he gave us a kind of a rather comforting, I found personally, kind of range of initiatives that uh, a newly reinvigorated GDS with its new strategy are looking to address. And we had a really uh, interesting chat about quite a lot of those. Um, won't go into those at this point. And then finally, thread four, we've got these three really interesting final takes from sectors, sectoral takes on digital leadership. So we heard from uh, Kirsty Waller and the importance of communication being absolutely key and how hard it is to how hard it is you need to work, if you like, to reward and recognize colleagues in these hybrid environments, which she conceived as hubs of community and connectivity balanced, if you remember, with working at home. So just the extra pressure it puts on all of us to actually communicate and hold people, and reach out and engage people. Again, chiming with all the authenticity and purpose um, uh, discussions we've been having. Um, uh, Lee McKenna then uh, picked up on some of this again, the need for authenticity, personality. And we heard the variety of really intriguing and, and, and kind of innovative ways she's been She's been trying to personalize really, really hard her relationships, not just with uh, people, colleagues, but also, of course, with users. She said, you know, it takes conversation to real lo reveal those pain points that then, as a digital leader, you could then start to address. And you've really got to reach out um, in innovative ways to do that. And then finally, a very, very interesting uh, uh, kind of session from Karen Lynch, this, this video we've just seen around personal purpose, um, the future of capitalism, digital social enterprises, um, and given certainly what I'm hearing in my organisation again around authenticity and purpose, um, these things really, really, really chimed. And certainly I'm going to be going and having a look at uh, eBay for change. So just putting it all together, I think things that are going to, that are going to stand out for me and I'm going to try and write a, a blog for Robin for DL Network on this. Thinking differently, business model change, interoperability, complexity in the network way in which it's going to happen, unique pressures on digital leaders, authenticity and trust, full agenda for government now and in a reinvigorated GDS, um, future um, generation and digital teams to kind of think about as well, not just the present. Um, the way in which we work has absolutely changed forever. This notion of balancing hubs of, of, of community and connectivity with working from home, diverse ways needed to engage and draw people out, and the need to enshrine personal purpose in everything that we do. I would say that's been a pretty full Digital Leaders Conference. So thank you very much for joining me, all of the guests, and, and last but certainly not least, thank you so much to Robin and uh, Digital Leaders for, for laying on yet another successful and really fascinating event. And uh, with that, thanks very much and go out and enjoy the sun.